Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is coming into its second year in early access, with its full launch planned for Q2 of this year. Through it all, we've seen some wild changes to the game, from optimizations to whole features being brought in that the community has requested. Tailworlds has done a great job of delivering on a lot of its promises, but you might be wondering, is Bannerlord worth playing in 2022? I've done these videos twice now, once six months after early access and another at the start of last year. With a whole other year under its belt, it's safe to say that Bannerlord is only getting better. That doesn't mean there aren't some issues that still exist within the game, and I will be going through all of that with you here today. In the last video, version 1.5.7 had just launched, so we will be going from version 1.5.7 to 1.70, the current beta branch as of the posting of this video, and probably Bannerlord's biggest and best patch yet. I'll go ahead and link last year's video in the upper right so you can get a sense of what has changed prior to this year, though, if you'd like. And if you'd like to navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most, you can find the chapters linked in both the timeline and the description. But in my typical fashion of upfronting the knowledge within my videos, let me give you a quick summary of my opinion of Bannerlord up to this point. And honestly, the game has come a long way from version 1.57 to 1.7. Uh, sieges feel epic with a lot of the improvements and fixes done to them. Now, they're still not 100%, but the siege ladders, towers, and rams being fixed, you'll find that they are far more engaging. They've added in key battles, uh, the highly touted battle terrain system, and even a pre-battle setup called Order of Battle System. You can grant peerage to your companions now, making them nobles, and you just have far more transparency when it comes to assigning people as roles in parties or captains within your army. And speaking of that, recruitment and upgrading has been overhauled and it's just way nicer. Uh, navigating through towns and cities has had a nice UI update. You can now pillage by devastating, pillaging, or showing mercy to any village that you raid, which is awesome. Uh, tournaments have been improved, so you can do prison breaks also. Towns can now rebel and become their own factions. Crafting has had a huge overhaul done to it. There are just so many things. Now, with all that is, of course, some negatives, which I have covered in their own section if you want to jump ahead, but the game's core mechanic in the beginning is still very much the same. There's just not much to do in the early game if you've played a heap of hours like myself or a lot of the people that have been playing for, you know, hours and hours. Now, I don't expect that to change a ton, but adding in some additional layers to the early game would be a huge step up for any veteran. Also, Creating your own kingdom is still a huge challenge that isn't particularly laid out to the player as far as both its challenge level or the requirements one truly needs outside of simply just a certain clan tier. And honestly, I don't feel like that's a very transparent way to let you know that, hey, by starting a kingdom, you are getting into a whole hornet's nest of a bad time. But those are my two bigger negatives right now, and with a heap of mechanics on the horizon, most of the stuff I was going to bring up as missing are just kind of on the way. Tailworlds has been very vocal about what the future of the game looks like as far as new features being added and the inclusion of, you know, banner bearers, vocalization, cutscenes for more of the important in-game events, and other goodies that just has me excited for the future. So if you haven't played Bannerlord, you are in for an absolute amazing ride. So many of the game's base features have been fixed or fine-tuned that it'll be a glorious time. If you have played Bannerlord and were waiting for things to be more feature complete, come back. It's time. The changes to combat, uh, army feeling like it actually has weight again, spear bracing, sieges, all of it is just so awesome and it's the perfect time to make a new character with all the skills now having complete and working perks. So if that's all you wanted to know, Please, by all means, feel free to shut the video down. But before you do, don't forget to comment, like, or subscribe. I cannot tell you how much that helps me out and it defeats the dreaded YouTube algorithm. But for those that want to get into the details here, let's get started on Is Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord Worth It in 2022? So to start us off, we're gonna go through some general gameplay improvements. And one of the first big ones is a number of code refactors, again, for campaign, inventory, battles, stuff that makes it so that you have better performance when live, either zoning into any of those things like battles or inventory, stuff like that. Stuff that removes a lot of the hanging that would occur whenever you jump into multiple or different screens. Now, 
One of the big standout things here is the new inclusion of a sandbox campaign. You have your standard old campaign, which has the uh, quest and a sandbox. And if I go ahead and click this button, you'll also note that we have got not just simply a new campaign, but an intro for it. This intro gives us really good context as to what's going on in the world of Colradia. Now, you can see here, years, it's going. I don't want to ruin it for you if you've not seen it, so we're going to skip past that uh, because this brings us into our next perk. But that intro is really good because it gives you a presence or at least context as to what the hell is going on so you understand why your character is what they're doing, what the other factions are doing in the world, the cultures as it were, so on and so forth. But here on the screen, we have our cultures we can select from when you create a new character. And we now get different cultural perks. Every single perk now has got two bonuses and one um, penalty, I guess you could say. So for Vlandia here, 5% more renown from battles and 15% more income while serving as a mercenary. 10% production bonus to villages that are bound to castles. But recruiting lords to armies costs more influence. Remember, this used to be a flat experience bonus, which used to be kind of like the superior cultural uh, uh, pick. Now it's had a little bit of a tooling here. Sturgeons, recruiting and upgrading infantry troops are 25% cheaper, which is quite nice. Armies lose 20% less daily cohesion, but there's also 20% more relationship penalty from kingdom decisions. For the Empire, 20% less uh, garrison troop wage, and being in an army brings 25% 25% uh, more influence. Village hearths increase 20% less, meaning that the uh, village themselves do not upgrade as quickly or get as large, so on and so forth. So it takes them longer to provide better recruits, uh, etc., etc. For Asarai, we've got caravans are 30% cheaper to build with the 10% less trade penalty. And there's no speed penalty on desert, which is very nice, especially because the Asarai lands are entirely desert. Daily wages of troops in the party, though, are increased by 5%. For Kazate, we get recruiting and upgrading mounted troops are 10% cheaper. 25% production bonus to horse, mule, cow, and sheep in villages owned by Kazate rulers. And 20% less tax income from towns. Uh, this one's very huge because Kazate's ability to move around the map very quickly has been curtailed uh, because it used to be part of a cultural trait, which allowed them to move uh, while mounted very fast. For Britannia, 50% less speed penalty and 15% uh, sight range bonus in forests. Towns owned by Britannian rulers have one militia production, or plus one to militia production, and 10% slower build rate for town projects in settlements. So that is a, a really big change to the way cultures work. And like I've said before, if, you've, if you're just starting back into the game and you didn't play when this culture uh, addition happened, you now have a whole different approach to gameplay. Um, and all this stuff is retroactive for the most part. Uh, you shouldn't need to create new campaigns from what I understand. Another thing here too is with the custom battle screen. Uh, custom battle screens, uh, you've got more players to choose from, which is nice. You can have a little bit more granularity there. But the biggest change and the best change is for anyone that wants to do any kind of specific unit testing. So let's say, you know, I want to just test what Blondian units uh foot soldiers can do. Well, I click this button and I now can select which units are gonna come into the battle. Even if I just want just the sergeants, I can do that. So it gives you a lot of really cool ways to test certain units in a very uh, controlled environment. And the same thing for any other unit here, right? You just click this and you can go ahead and just do it. And a cool thing is it'll also help, uh, it'll also allow you to choose stuff like the boar novices are Vlandian, um, what are they called? Minor Clansmen, same thing with the Sprouts. So you can actually do that with, uh, so we'll go over here to Empire. You'll see the Hastati, Princi uh, Principes, Principes, whatever you want to call it, and Triarii are all three in this uh, region. Um, Hidden Hand is in here as well. Uh, so it's really cool that you get to, you can test these units out and see how they actually perform, which is very nice indeed. And the last big thing on this menu I want to talk about, well, probably not the last one, we'll go through another another quick thing, is the saved game menu. So if I click over here now, if I click on this character, you can see, oh, the modules as always, but now I see more granularity here as far as the day, the level. We had that before, but now I get to see his health, his money, his influence, his party and how many are wounded, how much food he has, how many fiefs, if any, he has. So you get a lot better management through the saved campaigns. Of course, 
we have the individual campaigns like this that was added, uh, I believe, in like 1.55, 1.56. But this is just a further kind of nuance into what each save game has. And when it does come to creating a new campaign, you have got difficulties that you can select. So you can say, hey, you know, I want this character to be, uh, I want this to be a true Bannerlord. So the hardest difficulty possible. Let's just kind of click through this really quick and get to the other screen. I should have done this a second ago, but it won't matter. We'll do it right now. Uh, sure. And now, like I said, difficulty presets for Freebooter, Warrior, and Bannerlord. But there are some big ones. So enable birth and death. So choose the heroes are able to age and reproduce. This option cannot be changed later. So this is everyone in the game. Um, auto allocate clan member perks, not a big deal. But we also get Iron Man mode. Iron Man mode limits you to a single save file and automatically saves when you quit the game. This option cannot be changed later. So with sandbox mode, you can have Iron Man, uh, Iron Man on or you can have enable birth and death, but you can also customize what age you come into the game. So if you come in, we have enable birth and death on and you come in when you're later in life, you will actually have more focus points on a higher level and all that action, but you could die out. And then it makes it so that your kid has to take over in your stead. So there's an actual natural progression to the game with that in the sandbox mode that you do get in the standard campaign, but you maybe don't experience until much, much, much later in this campaign because you start out at age 24 or 28, I think it is, in the standard campaign. But let's jump into the game itself to talk about some other little changes that have happened. And a big one for people is the new crafting change. Now we have another one on the horizon, but it's not in just yet. So right now you've got crafting orders which have been added. This allows you to basically kind of have a focus for how you're going to increase your crafting skill. And these things are basically little orders that say, hey, you know, this guy wants two-handed pole arms and they want him to match these, these parameters, so on and so forth. And you get money for doing it. So basically like focused quests. So if you want, you can actually just simply be a blacksmith as your playthrough if you so wish. Also, when it comes to crafting and selecting and finding different items that has been overhauled and the price value of all this has been changed and overhauled as well. So it is a little bit of an easier, um, not, I'm sorry, not easier. It is a little bit more of a controlled um, situation versus before you could just make a javelin and just jack up its size and make it, you know, let's see here, uh, something with like the longest, like a huge spike head and just make it as big as possible and it would sell for like, 200k and break the game's economy that is no longer that way it can still happen but it cannot happen as rampantly as it did before so it is a nice change to the crafting system moving here into the encyclopedia we have some nice changes as well um if we jump over to troops i can now sort things by tier level whatever it is right if i jump over to heroes we can sort by age or relation we have a bunch of different things kingdoms by total strengths their fiefs their clans whatever it is you have now got this ability to actually manage through all this or sort through all this another nice thing too is let's just go ahead and click troops infantry and i'll just click a bunch of guys just kind of Sure. Okay, we've done some stuff. Now, if I press N, it closes my encyclopedia. If I press N again, it just brings me right back to where I was, which is very nice. If I accidentally close it or I wanted to keep a reference point of, say, hey, I'm trying to find this specific guy or <laughs> that's not a guy, <laughs> this specific woman, um, and I'm trying to find out where she is and I just keep jumping from location to location. Well, if I go to location, location, and then I want to find that person again in Encyclopedia, I can just press N and they're right back there for me. So that is a nice little quality of life improvement that's been done for the Encyclopedia. But there's also been a lot of troop rebalancing, changing of items, swapping out uh, certain weapons, adding certain weapons, stuff like the Sturgeons and their entire archer line has been made a lot more playable. Um, they've been given axes, better bows, better skill. So they're a lot better than they were before. And we've talked about the uh, other sides of the Sturgeon uh, tree and how that's been improved over time, but the same thing with Azurai um, and what have you. So the overall troops have been improved. Um, when it comes to villages, castles, and towns, the scenes have been improved so that the AI moves around them much better. There's new wanderers in the game. So those are some just kind of general improvements that were made to the game that don't really fit into some of the sections we're about to talk about next. So. Now that we've talked about all this, let's jump onto the campaign map itself and talk about some of the improvements there. 
the campaign map itself has had a lot of optimizations done to it. It feels a lot smoother when you're playing on the campaign map. It doesn't get all juddery and stammery at certain spots, and it doesn't kind of hang here and there. They've done a lot of good optimization to it as a whole. So just moving around is already nice. And a big quality of life improvement that came actually in just recent 1.7.0 is if I hold down Alt now, I can see the movement speed of the parties um, across the map. So if I'm trying to, say, pursue these looters, I know that my movement speed matches theirs. It, this is, makes it really nice if I'm saying trying to hunt down a caravan, stuff like that. It's just a very nice quality of life improvement that they've added here. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's some issue with the um, layering of it all, but it's going to be fixed here in a, in a patch or so, or during a hot fix, I believe they said. But um, also, they've done some nice UI improvements, some quality of life. So if I jump into any of the locations, I get a nice background um, into the settlement that befits its culture. So if I go to the keep, this kind of befits an imperial keep. The arena, same thing. Tavern district. It just makes it for a little bit more immersion into the game, which I like a lot. Now, speaking of arena... Right now, there's not an actual tournament going on here. But if there were a tournament going on, tournaments have been scaled now based off of the amount of nobles taking part in them. So if I were to do, say, a arena here or a tournament here, then it would just pretty much give me... Let's say there was no other nobles. Hey, yeah, well, here, here's, a, here's an item. Take it, buddy. But if there were, I think it's either four or six or more nobles, then it will give you a scaling item of increasing importance based on the amount present. So if there are like 10 nobles, let's say there's a whole entire army visiting, then the tournament is going to have more prestige attached to it so you can get an even better item, perhaps even some of the old legendary stuff that used to make its way through the arena system in the earliest portions of the game. It's now a little bit more present and easier to find by just simply finding um, a settlement that has a ton of nobles within it, which is very, very nice. Now, another thing, too, are these inclusion of village nameplates. And what I mean by that is, in the past, if I wanted to find out, say, what villages were supplying Sarunia here, I'd have to go to trade. And I could go over this, and it would tell me villages, um, the ones that are, are giving it, um, actual uh, production here. So grain and fish are coming from those two villages and then the shops in this town, wood workshop, silversmith, and brewery. Well, now if I just simply hover over this, it is going to tell me exactly where this all comes from. So if I hold down um, Alt, it says bound villages, uh, Sotai here in Vargornis. So it just gives me a nice little uh, context clue as to what towns actually supply what, right? Um, versus in the past, we were all guessing. It says, you know, bound settlement, Saronia. Or if I go over here to say this castle, well, what, does, what goes to this castle? Oh, it looks like it's these two towns right there, or this one right here. Oh, it looks like it's these two towns right here. So we get an actual direct correlation on what trades into what. So it's nice to finally kind of have that transparency built into the game. In addition to, these actual villages will evolve on the campaign map as their hearth increases, which is cool here. So this hearth says 173. I'm sure if I go across the map and find one that says much, a uh, much higher one, you can even get, here's a good example. This one probably has a little bit lower, or it's probably clipped into the ground. <laughs> but hearths with, so this has 306 hearth, and its actual mesh will look different than this guy over here. So it, it changes based off of the total, the total hearth value right here. Go over to this one, that's 247. So they get bigger, they've got more buildings attached to them. It looks a little bit cooler, has presence, right? It feels like the actual map is evolving around you, which is quite nice because there's two other things that are gonna evolve around you now. For one, the NPCs will die in simulations without you being present. So prior to this, if I were to say fight an army that was somewhere over here, right there if i were to jump into that army and i were to say have um permadeath on and i killed someone in there and they died that would be the only way in which they could die other aside from old age now the game simulation i think it's something like less than five percent chance have, that they can die in simulations meaning that the nobles of all of these factions are going to progressively push through clans like they would naturally so you could simply press Fast forward and let the game take its toll and it will actually have a dynamic 
campaign where the uh, balance of balance, the I'm sorry, not the balance of power, where the actual, um, I guess, intrigue or or the actual uh, ruling class of every single faction can come and go through natural death. They can actually just die in combat, and someone else can take uh, the reins of Kazate, for example. So. I really like that that's been brought into the game. It does add a lot of really cool dynamicism. I don't even know that's a real word, but I'm sticking with it. Um, another thing too here is if I were to go and attack, say, this village over here, pillaging it, you could do before. But now, if I want to do this, if I raid this village, I have an option at the end where I can choose to devastate, pillage, or show mercy. Uh, devastate means you're just completely wiping it out. Pillage means you're looting it more so than trying to kill everyone. And then showing mercy means you're just taking a little bit here and there and pretty much leaving one, everyone to their devices. So you get this as a cool kind of roguery gameplay style that you can build into it. Um, and another big thing too is, speaking of dynamicism, a word that is not really there, towns can now rebel. If they decide, hey, you know, we're not very happy, we're pretty pissed off, they will rebel against their parent and defeat the garrison defenders once they actually have enough um, built-in anger here and then become their own kingdom. So then the other kingdoms have to go and try and either remove it for themselves or take it back, right? If it's like, say, this happens with Kazate, Kazate's going to want this back, so they're going to go and siege it and take it back. So it's very cool to see that right now there's no one on the map that is rebelling, but you'll notice it when the, the uh, faction flag will just completely change color and everything. You're like, wait a minute, who the hell is this? And it's an actual rebel faction that's taken over within that city. So that adds a really cool little bit of uh, granularity there. Um, two other things, though, I want to show off are one, uh, prison break. I'm I'm I've got the con the cheat console open, so I can do whatever the hell I want. So we're gonna press this button. Now, if I go to Scout the Keep, it says Stage a Prison Break because this guy is obviously. Um, uh, a prisoner of Kazate. So you can actually stage a prison break and go through a process of breaking them out of prison, which gives you relation and it's a great way to increase your charm. It is such a cool mechanic being, that has been brought into the game. Um, also too, I, I think I should be able to do this without any problem. We're gonna find out right now. Maybe the guards will attack me. Oh, no, kick the, kick the door. That's probably the best way to open it. Um, there's a new UI when you're looking around any kind of town or settlement. So if I hold down Alt, you can see it's got more colors added to it. There's not just text and overlapping crap everywhere. If I hover over into the center of the screen, oh, that's the linen weavery? Cool. What's over here? It's a guy who gives me a quest. Cool. It's Tuval the Lamb. Good old Tuval. Him and I had a really good uh, little holiday party together. Over there's the dungeon. So this UI has been brought in and it allows you to really kind of see what's going on in the settlement or in the town a little bit easier other than a lot of overlapping white icons that really don't give you much context clues to what the hell is going on. So I really do like this. This is probably one of my favorite quality of life improvements for the settlement so far. But this covers everything as far as general campaign map improvements. Let's move now into the party screen. So in the past, you've had to recruit people by manually going down to the location, clicking it, pressing this button, and you'd recruit them, right? Or if you wanted to upgrade someone, manually going over to this location, find them, clicking it, and doing it. And especially if you have multiple people, this would sometimes be very tedious. In the new clan, or new uh, party screen here, uh, for one, the prisoners menu is sticky. So if I scroll down, you can see it kind of hovers in place right there. So it's nice. So even if I have like, you know what, I don't even, I want to just, I just want to look at my troops. Okay, well, there we go. Or hey, you know what, let me just go right to the prisoners. There we go. So it's nice to have that kind of be sticky. But the big thing here is this. So if I click this button, um, I can go ahead and just do my upgrades through here. I don't have to go ahead and go all the way down, click, 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 click. Just go control, left click, left click, left click. And it tells me how much money, how many horses, if any, whatever it's gonna require or whatever I'm gonna lose by upgrading, it's gonna tell me right there. So I press done and it's done. You can tell, it tells me, hey, it's not done yet. I have to press done at the bottom to kind of finalize it, but I've basically just upgraded everyone. And even moreover, let's say I wanna recruit some prisoners. Press this button, same thing, but it's gonna tell me, hey, you're gonna lose some morale if you do this, but let's just go ahead and press these buttons. Good to go, done, and now I know, cumulatively, I'm gonna lose morale and lose some and pay some money. And like I said, if this were anyone wanting to jump onto horses, it would also be present there. But another thing, let's see if this guy actually wants to fight. Cool, send troops, done, great, boom. 
this has been added. This is kind of not really party screen, but I'm going to kind of do it anyway. So let's go ahead and press done. And then we've got this. So you need, it'll say here that your troops will gain 1,000 experience for donating weapons and or armor, depending on your perks. They gain a maximum of 79,000 experience. So that's based off of your total party size. So for example here, um, I've had it so that I've had so many weapons and armor that this text turns red, meaning that I've capped out the amount of experience I can give them by weapons and armor going to my troops rather than my inventory. And the way that that works is I just simply press done here and the, the, those weapons, those armor, or that, those weapons, that armor goes to my troops and not to my inventory. It, they just get experience instead, which is a really cool way to say, oh, you know what? I don't need any of this crap. I have 300,000 gold. I'm not going to be taking any benefit off of a tattered wrapped headcloth that's going to sell for damn near nothing. So this is a great way to get a lot of experience on your troops. Let's just go ahead and press done. It went to them. Hey, and five more people are ready to be upgraded. And I can just simply go through the screen and bam, bam, boom, bing, bong. And it tells me one horse is being used here, a war horse, for example, and done. So those are some really great improvements that have happened here to the party screen. Jumping into the character screen, we've got some other improvements that have been made, namely towards charm and engineering. Those were the last ones, I believe, to not really get big uh, perk overhauls just yet. I believe last time we did this video, yeah, it was charm and engineering that were mything, mi missing. <laughs> so they've had their perks brought in. Charm just recently in version 1.7.0 with a really strong one here in Immortal Charm. Every five skill after 250 gives you one influence per day, which is great if you are a mercenary. Smithing has still not gotten a perk update yet where, to have, where it gets secondary perks. Um, I'm sorry, secondary bonuses attached to every perk but i imagine that's coming with the second uh, update to crafting i think that should kind of apply to smithing here but the biggest thing on the character screen here is this up top so remember in the past that if you were leveling up a character they would only increase their character level based off of the total amount of skill points that you earned it even still says sp right here so this would follow suit with something like elder scrolls skyrim Every time you wanted to level up in Skyrim, you had to get 10 skill levels to get a character level. In Bannerlord, that character level, the requirement for skill points or skill levels, would increase exponentially per um, level. This has changed. Now it's based off of total cumulative experience. Because the problem was in the past, you would stall around levels 15, 16, and 17. But now with total cumulative experience, you're not going to hit that barrier as easily. You'll now start to hit actual skill barriers that are going to require you to go down uh, attribute and focus point attribution, which is what should have happened from the start. So it's a much better, more balanced system. And I don't remember if this happened prior to version 1.57 or not, but it's just worth bringing up in the writing skill tree. You now have a mounted weapon damage and weapon speed and reload penalty when you are on horseback if you've got zero skill. I believe that this is a 30%, negative 30% natively, and it will drop every skill point you get until you think, I think you reach right around this point, 100 or 125, then it will become zero. But it makes it so that uh, horse archers in the very beginning portions of the game used to be very strong. They've been now more brought in line with other combat characters that aren't stupid strong right out the gate. So that is just kind of worth noting, but those are the changes here to the character screen. Jumping into the clan screen, we get a ton of new granularity as well. So if we move over to the parties tab, I can see all of the roles within my party. Now in the past, in the just the base game, um, if you had no one assigned to a role, it was assumed you were the person for that role. So it shows right now, party leader is default for unassigned roles and just puts a little kind of grayed out picture there for you. So the cool thing now is if I click this button and hover over, any of the people in my party, it'll tell me their skill and then what that skill would give effects to the party. So for example, myself, I have 521 engineering on this character. So here's all the perks that apply to that and the effects that would then apply to the party. So faster siege engine production and max difficulty of siege engine that can be built is 521. So getting that is really cool because maybe you can't decide between characters with multiple meta with high uh, medicine skill here, right? Or maybe scouts that have high scouting skill, 
Okay, this is a good example here. This person's got 124 scout. They've got a bunch of perks. What's the overall effect? Cool, I get to see it. What about this one? Well, they've got 40 and they just get this one perk and those are the effects. So it's nice to be able to see these things. In addition to your uh, companions, you can now grant them peerage, meaning you can make them nobles within your kingdom. So if I click the kingdom tab, because this character has created a kingdom, I can see that we own some fiefs, but I've already assigned some fiefs to these nobles that I have actually um, granted peerage to. These are just normal wanderers that I've had in my party that I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to make you a vassal of mine. I'm going to make you a, um, uh, a noble and I can abdicate leadership. It's, I mean, you have all these ways now that you can be a better leader and you can build a clan up from the uh, a kingdom up from the clan level up to kingdom by assigning your uh, companions as nobles within your kingdom because then they will go and make their own clan, which is really cool. So if I look at his clan, he has members of it. He's got his own companions within his clan, which is awesome. And he'll grow that, he'll get married. So it's a really, really, really cool way to kind of grow the game uh, from, from, the, from the start there. Um, you can also, this character, this character is sandbox mode, so I don't have the older brother from the campaign, but you can also now give him peerage. And your kids, you can tutor, and you can tutor them at ages 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, and 16. And at each age, you basically do a same prompt that you would as if you were trying to create a character. So that's a nice little, nice little bit in there. So the last thing I do want to show off here is... Um, emissaries. So we can just jump over to this location, jump over to here, I can press leave members, and I click this, and they will act as an emissary in this location, trying to improve my relations with these notables. So this is a great way to say, hey, you know what, I want to make it so I can recruit more troops here, or just overall increase my uh, standing with this location. You can now use these emissaries to do that passively for you. Moving into the inventory screen, we're just going to quickly go over some of the new items. Nothing really changed here for the most part. So we get the new, well, this is a new one. The uh, Luxury Turban over helmet. That one's that new one that's been added in. The Kuzate Battle Crown here, which is pretty sweet looking. The Asteride Decorated Chainmail, which is great. The Ornate Legionary Scale Mail, with also the Decorated Legionary Scale Mail. Or just mail, just mail, just normal mail. Um, we get the Batanian Long Tartan. Tartan over trousers, right? Like that. Uh, the ornate desert battle crown. So just to kind of show off some of the new things that have been added. Mainly it's applying to Asurai and Batania with some, a few Imperial and Kazate things. Not as many Sturgia this year and very, there's not been a single Blondian thing that I can think of that's been added really, uh, really at all. Like that's one of the new Sturgeon things that came, I believe, last year. But like I said, not, not as much Sturgeon or uh, uh, Blondian stuff. Next up, I want to talk about combat and two big standout features, the battle terrain system and the order of battle system. So for the battle terrain system, the way this works is, and they've teased this some time ago, that pretty much when you look around across the map, you'll see tons of varying ter uh, terrain, bridges, all sorts of fun action, forests, whatnot. Well, the way the battle terrain system works is it di basically dictates a number of numbers across the map and says if you get into combat, on one of those numbers, it correlates to X map. So take, for example, this little bridge crossing. I've got some mountain banners right underneath me. So if I jump on them, I should hopefully jump into an actual bridge battle here. Let's see, okay, cool. Actually, I was hoping he wouldn't say, no, I don't wanna do it. And there are some issues with uh, the battle train system in that sometimes it doesn't actually create the specific map you want it to. Uh, like for instance, right now, this is not an actual bridge battle and th this is the beta branch for 1.7 right now so that is um something they're working on fixing but they are also adding a ton more scenes so what that means is that when you jump into certain battles right now it's kind of a generic somewhat similar location to where it's at it's like the set region around there it should be pretty similar but as they kind of expand the game they'll have more and more of these battle scenes that will actually start to completely 100 percent one for one match the location on the terrain um it also depends for the battle scenes it seems to be the stone bridges are the ones that actually cause the battle scenes um so for this we have the new order of battle system and the way that this works is i can see every single formation 
that I have access to. And then I can divvy people into different formations if I so wish. And this is a kind of like a pre-battle setup, right? If you're familiar with Total War, it's kind of like that phase. So let's take, for example, here, uh, let's just go to three. I've got all of my cav right there, right? Well, I can press this button and I can say, you know, give preference to troops with heavy armor. And then I can go ahead and say, oh, 50% of this. Oops, sorry, I want to press this button. Now I'm pressing 50% of my cav. We'll go ahead and do that. So it's going to move 50% of it, 53% in this example here, um, to uh, number uh, six over here. I almost said four, but that's not right. Um, to number six over here. So now that I have got two units of cav as set, but this is my heavy armor cav, right? But maybe I want these guys to be uh, ones with pull arms or with throwing weapons, whatever it is, you can kind of set these preferences as you see fit to kind of best fit how you want to break up any of these formations if you want to. Now, in addition to that, you get these symbols right here. These are all of your captains for each formation. Remember how you used to do this in the party screen? It's not the case anymore. Now, you simply press this button and you'll choose a captain from this list. And if you look at this, you're like, oh, well, I don't really know who to put, who to put in this list. Well, hold down Alt and I can now see what each one of these characters does for the influence of the unit it'll do. So, oh man, this guy is particularly good for infantry. He's gonna give all these bonuses to infantry based off of the perks that he has selected. Maybe this character over here is a little bit better for cav or horse archers, or this character, me, myself, and I'm gonna be great with cav, horse archers, and infantry. So this allows you to choose who you wanna put in what location, right? So let's just go ahead and say this guy here. I don't think I actually have a good character for yeah, I don't have a good character here for archers. But unfortunately, too, as of the implementation of this patch, uh, this is just infantry. I don't think it actually says archers, if I can remember properly here. Um, infantry troops information are leading this movement speed increased, damage speed increased, foot troops information speed increased. Yeah, so um, it'll just depend on what you're trying to look for here. Uh, but some of them will say this is for horse archers, this is for infantry, this is for cav. Um, but, but basically, you're choosing whatever unit you want or whatever captain you want to then yield and control that unit here, right? We'll give, I'll put myself there just, just because I could, I can. And he's got horse archer stuff, so I'll give that. So now I've got captains that correlate to the bonuses they would otherwise give. And this individual here is going to jump over into the first one. They'll basically be socketed into whatever makes the most sense. Looking at her stats, she's got one-handed skill, so she'll go into the infantry unit. If she had a bow and arrow, she'd go over to the archery. So it just depends upon what stats they've got the most of. So those are two really big standout things, but there's also more. Let's go ahead and press ready. We've jumped into the actual fight here. I'm going to get off my horse, and I'm going to just start running. And if any of you have played this before, you know it can be really hard, especially if you're on horseback, to give orders on the fly. Well, if I press this button, the game slows down 75% to allow me to issue any kind of commands that I so wish. You can toggle this off in the um, options if you don't quite like it, but I think it's a great, great ability here. In fact, I'm actually going to go one, hold fire, two, hold fire. I don't want any, I don't want any of this to end too soon here. He is really yelling. And now I'm going to switch over to my pike because my pike also has something special that was added in one of the more recent patches. If I press Z, I'll actually, oh, X, I'll actually spear brace. And so will my entire front line, actually, if the length of their spear is over 230. This makes it so that you can actually have a formidable phalanx in the event that you get charged by cavalry. The AI will automatically switch on over to their... Uh, to their spears, their pull arms, if it makes sense. So a really, really great feature there. Now, one last thing I wanna talk about here in this battle is, take a look at the top. The morale has been added in. The improved morale system has been brought in so it actually works. So if units are killing other units, it increases their morale. If they're losing catastrophically, they're gonna lose morale. Also, you can see that this has gotten an overhaul in and of itself. We get a numerical value next to each and all of the actual, um, uh, what's it called? Next to each and every one of the actual morale. And we actually get um, what ammo is left at the bottom of two and four. You get what ammo they've got left in that unit itself. So you get a lot more information now whenever you take a look at these uh, uh, systems here. It's a lot more granular and gives you just a better idea of what's going on.
All right, we've moved into Siege just to talk about these Siege Towers, something that a lot of people have wanted to be fixed for a long time, and you can see in this instance they are fixed. They sometimes have a little trouble starting off because they're waiting for the drawbridge to drop, but as soon as it does at the top, they just start piling up here. Let's go ahead and go into photo mode here and uh, look around. I unfortunately don't have my mod that allows me to navigate around the map quickly, but you can see here going over to the other one, this has already got men climbing up it, both sides, or all three ladders, they're already on the top over here, and I think that the actual battering ram got destroyed, um, because that'll actually determine what happens with these siege towers, which is really cool here. But Overall, when you look at these sieges, they feel a lot, yeah, the, the battering ram got destroyed, so you can see there's so many more troops over at this one siege tower, but as a result, sieges just feel a lot more epic to actually see the siege towers being used properly, the battering rams being used properly once again, and also they've added in this thing called local superiority. So if I look over here at... I know there's that pocket of troops, and they probably, yeah, I didn't put very many troops in the map for the opponent, just so I can make this happen. But if I were to say warp right here, which, which I can do using the console, but I just can't in a custom battle. If I were to warp behind this pocket of units, local superiority dictates that basically the unit will now prioritize and go, okay, the threat level of that single soldier versus this block of soldiers is not worth compromising our position. We'll only send two or three soldiers out to go deal with it. Rather than before, the whole entire pocket of units would get displaced and it would cause a hell on all the pathfinding and all these other issues. So they've added all these things in here to make the pathfinding in uh, towns, in castles, a lot better, better so that the units move from defensive point to defensive point a lot more succinctly rather than taking weird roundabout ways or just getting stuck in places that no one's actually attacking. And the result here is an actual awesome defense or actual fun offense to play against the opponent. Now, clearly there's no reason for them to keep their shields up right now. I've removed archers from this custom battle just to just show off a ton of infantry piling up these siege ladders, but you can see that it's working as intended. Things are working pretty well. If that battering ram had made it through, they would have blown through the gates and then they would have actually attacked the inner gate and kept going. And it's a cool thing now that the AI will assess which route is kind of the path of least resistance and allocate more troops to that. If they're winning in one of the three paths, because there's three paths in a siege, they will start to use that, that path more and less of the one that they're getting butchered the most at and a little bit less in the, uh, a little bit more on the one that they're just kind of like on even ground with. So the AI does a way better job of kind of calculating how to properly deal with sieges and how to kind of mount stuff. It's like we'll, we'll go up the top here. So overall, Things have become a lot better, and once this siege, once we win this siege, there is a keep battle for the defenders who can then select which troops they want to have actually defend the keep, much like you're going into an actual bandit camp. So, sieges themselves feel a lot better, look a lot better, and they are just absolutely epic. So, with all that being said, what are some of the negatives? You know, what are some things that are just not great right now? And to be fair, there are some things that I have addressed or, or would have normally addressed that are actually coming to the game. So I won't put them in this negative section because it's not particularly fair. I'll put it in the next section of what's on the horizon. So if I don't bring it up here, it might be in the next section. So hang tight. But first off, banner pasting, it is still disabled by the developers. Um, they've disabled it because it was causing a superfluous bloat of dev logs. Basically, people would submit bug reports when they copied a banner incorrectly into the game, and it would just cause more work for them. So that is shut off. I do want that to be eventually turned back on, but for right now, it is turned off. But the big thing here, and I mentioned this in the intro to the video, is the game still feels like there's a lack of armor variety for certain factions or certain body parts. You know, for example, there's a ton of different chest pieces. If I click this, there's a ton of different chest and helmets. But when it comes all the way down to gloves and boots, there's really not a whole ton. And then even when we're looking at chests there's tons of variety across different factions but when it comes to helmets there's not a lot of variety and even that variety is pretty much helmets though the same exact helmet with a different base layer like uh, chain or leather or mail whatever it is 
There still isn't a ton of variety when it comes to certain body parts that I would like to see increased. Also, there needs to be more early game things to do outside of just kill looters, run tournaments, and then clear banded hideouts. Those are your three big things that you do in the beginning of the game, more or less. They did add um, cultural start positions. So if you do start as the Empire, you'll start in an Empire location, Azerai down here, um, Vlandia, Sturgia, and Kazay, as, as you would expect. So that is a nice little improvement, but still, there needs to be some more layering into that initial portion of the game. And I'm not saying tons and tons of new mechanics, but just add uh, more diversity. Okay, if it's arenas, we'll add jousting or add an actual leaderboard to have a yearly grand tournament. Stuff like that that actually gives a little bit more to the existing mechanic in the game. Also, like I've said, crafting, while in a great place right now, it still needs a little bit more of a facelift. I would love the ability to edit or modify existing weapons because maybe, you know, I just don't have the wherewithal to go unlock all these pieces. Maybe I just want to make modifications upon the existing weapon and maybe they make certain restrictions, right? Like, okay, you can, um, you can modify axes, but you can only modify maybe the handle or you can modify swords, but you can maybe only modify the tang uh, not the tang, I'm sorry, the uh, the quillins or the guard, whatever it is, or um, uh, the grip, whatever it is, but maybe not the blade itself. Maybe there's certain kinds of restrictions, but more nuance into crafting, I think, is, is definitely needed. Now, another big one I'm pretty huge on, and this is one I've got videos for, tons of stuff, but it's kingdom stuff. And creating your own kingdom right now, I feel it needs to be a better experience. Uh, there needs to be harder and better set of parameters to hit. Because right now, all you have to do is get a clan tier four or five. That's that's too nebulous. Uh, you know, reach a clan tier and have a settlement. That's all you need to do. It doesn't really gear you up for what you're about to deal with. So I think you should have to have, you know, certain sets of skills or certain number of nobles under your banner. Just basically some form of context to the player that creating your own kingdom is dialing up the difficulty of the game a ton. And you should be prepared for it. Otherwise, you'll get to clan tier 4 or 5, you'll go ransack some random ass settlement, you'll make a kingdom, and then just get destroyed by the AI. There should be something that tells you, okay, well, you need to be better equipped for this. You have to have uh, maybe uh, two castles and or, or one city. Uh, you have to have to have a certain amount of money that you won't maybe lose. Maybe it's kind of used to immediately increase the standing of something like that. Or, or maybe it's certain skills that have to be met. Basically, tell the player that this is not just like a press a button and have more fun. It's press a button and really set like the wolves at the gate for you. Because now all these other factions are going to want to destroy you as fast as possible. So that's a big one I, I'm really big on. Uh, feasts. Let's bring feasts into the game. Make this... The cheese party I've always wanted. Bring that Butterlord back. Um, also, this the main campaign, not the sandbox campaign. It's still pretty bare bones. And that's kind of not very fair because I've said the stuff's coming in the future for that. But I'd also lastly like to see some form of royal intrigue within each faction, right? We know we Durthard is the ruler of Valandia, but I'd like to do some things to kind of create some form of intrigue there. But that might be covered in the claim and quests in our next section. So let's jump on over here to what's on the horizon. So back in August of 2021, Tale of Worlds released this blog post saying future plans. And this pretty much outlined all the stuff that they were working on until pretty much until release. And almost all of this has come to fruition. We've gotten a new battle terrain system. We've gotten, period, we've gotten peerage for our companions, the order of battle system, which we talked about. But there are still some other things that are coming, like battle or banner bearers so they've talked about that for a long time that is coming to the game this will make battles more colorful and visually diverse but it will also be gameplay effects the soldiers marching under each banner which is awesome party templates which is really great uh cut scenes here's an example of one so you've lost a family member you'll actually get a cool cut scene attached to it or sally out missions now this is different right so right now if you do a sally out when you're doing a siege you just jump into a generic actual land battle, but they want it to actually be localized to the specific siege scene that you're doing a siege of. So you would you would fight in front of the walls rather than just on an open field, which is great. Also, more scenes being brought into the game, so that means improvements on existing towns and villages and um, current battle maps, adding more of those to the terrain battle system. A very awesome approach right here, right? 
Also, Claimant Quests, I wonder why that's highlighted. Oh, I was searching Claimant earlier. Um, but basically, Claimant Quests, we don't really know a lot about here. So the setting of Mountain Blade 2 Bound, uh, Mountain Blade 2 Banner Lord is one of turmoil, with the Emperor murdered in the Colorado Empire he, uh, heading towards civil war. It should come as no surprise that such of times of uh, that such times of change provide opportunities to actors that would otherwise have stayed in the shadows. They may just need the right hero to help them press their claim. So, is this the claimant to the imperial throne? Are we going to be have some sort of intrigue attached to the other factions? A lot of cool things, hopefully included within. The, and quests and then vocalization like i was saying too uh vocalizing a lot of the dialogue portions of banner lord uh, that will allow us to get a lot more immersion into the game so these are just some of the things that are on the horizon that are really 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 awesome coming with banner lord not to mention the slew of mods that already exist for the game there's been way better deployment of those mods too with the most recent 1.7 patch Honestly, Bannerlord is really shaping up to be in a strong place because of a lot of these future innovations and the big end of year 1.7 patch that basically took this entire article and blasted it into the game. So at that, it brings our video here to a close. And the ultimate question is still, should you play Bannerlord in 2022? Is it worth it in 2022? And I, I think you've gotten the gist of what I'm saying here, right? It definitely is. If you've never played it, it's now is the best time to play it. You've got so much more to, to dive in on. There's so much more life in the world itself. The AI is way more intelligent to the way it reacts to you. And to see the things that are on the horizon is just very exciting. And like I've said before, the mods for this game are so incredible. The modding community is so passionate and they've dived into so many different things. We've got Warhammer, we've got Lord of the Rings, we've got uh, Game of Thrones. There is just so much stuff. Right now there's a really big one that's going around, uh, Eagle Rising, that basically puts Rome into the game with a bunch of other um, armies from antiquity. So there's just so much diversity built into this game that we've had in Mountain Blade Warband, right? There, people modded the hell, out of the hell out of that game, and we're still getting that here with Bannerlord, and the game's not even hit its full-on launch yet. So I'm very excited for the future. Now, if you've already played the game, what's worth coming back to? Now, if you've already played, I still think the game is in an amazing position now. And if depending on when you stopped playing, if you stopped playing in the last three or four months, I honestly don't think that there's a whole ton to experience outside of the order of battle and the battle terrain system as well as new sieges. I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. But if you've not played in a year, the game's going to feel very different. The way that the game's optimization is at, the way that the AI reacts to a lot of things in combat, and the actual kingdom diplomacy is in a much better place. Could all those things be improved more? Absolutely, but I'm still saying that you will definitely notice a marked difference in the way that this game plays. One thing I actually didn't bring up in the video at all, I should just remember right now, is N NVIDIA DLSS has now been fully integrated into the game too. So if you are having performance issues, which actually should have been fixed with the optimization, it will probably be fixed even further with NVIDIA DLSS. So there you go, guys. There's a pretty much a big rundown here of Bannerlord in uh, the beginning of 2022. And this will obviously change throughout the year. But go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Have you been playing this whole time and you agree? Have you been playing this whole time and you disagree? Have you not been playing and you want to finally get a chance to jump in? Let me know what your thoughts are. And if there's any big standout features that I might have missed that you think are very important to convey to anyone coming back or looking to jump into the game for the first time, by all means, let that information be known in the comment section. I always like to try to disseminate as much information to the folk as possible. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.